hope you enjoyed the tutorial. I'm Sergey, and I will talk about video synthesis and manipulation. In the first session of the tutorial, we covered image representations. Our interest was mainly in generating or extending spatially consistent image content. In the second session, we looked at different representations for objects such as hair, face or an arbitrary 3D object such as furniture or a car. Although we couldn't generate sequences of frames with the methods from the letter group, our focus was on generating a reasonable and controllable manipulation of an object, and we didn't care much about the temporal domain. In this session, our primary focus is to synthesize and predict videos, animate static objects from a single or multiple images. In short, we now want to focus on the temporal domain. But first, let's talk why it is important. According to neuroscience, our world is likely to be a hallucination. Let me quote, Neuroscientists like to say that our day-to-day -day experience is a carefully controlled hallucination constrained by the world and your body but ultimately constructed by your brain. This quote is from seven and a half lessons about the brain. Brains do prediction all the time. We anticipate events consciously, but here they mean that brain can predict and show us something without us noticing it. Wouldn't it be great for a computer to have similar abilities? We could generate more data, anticipate visual events and create multiple futures of the same situation. Alright, let's see where we are. As Stefan shown at the beginning, we can generate images by using generative adversarial networks. We sample the noise, use the generator to generate and the discriminator to tell if the images look good. Surprisingly, the latent space of such a model is, a con is continuous and smooth. Interpolation produces interesting results, and in such space each point is an image. To generate videos, a straightforward extension of such system can be made in which each point of the latent space will correspond to a video. Temporal discriminator can tell if the video looks good. There were several methods that proposed that. A method on the left generates a video using three branches. The first one is the background branch. It generates a static image similarly to how image GANs operate. The second is the foreground spatial temporal cube. It's dynamic. The background and the foreground are combined using the output of the third branch, the mask. In the end we get a spatial temporal cube which can be trained in the adversarial manner using a video discriminator. Another notable work is TGAN or temporal GAN. It uses a global latent to generate a sequence of latent codes for each frame and generates each frame using an image-based generator. To find a better representation for videos, let's look at a toy example and try to model it with such approaches. Assume we have a simple video, such as this. An object moves from top left to bottom right with constant speed. Objects can be of three shapes, three colors and can be seen only at a limited location in the video. Clearly the latent space can be very compact. In a model which associates a latent code to a video, many factors of variations are redundant. Despite this, videos have much in common and they be modeled by different latents. Let's see if this holds for more realistic videos. Imagine a person doing some facial expression and then the same person doing a different one, then a different person doing the same expression sequence. The same works for other videos as well. So we see that content and motion can be separated in a video. We can then use content subspace in which a point defines the object doing the action and a motion subspace in which a trajectory defines temporal execution of the action. Let's now compare the two representations. On the left, every point of the latent space is a video. Such representation supports only fixed length videos. You cannot control the video and it's not clear what video interpolation means. On the right, 
We use motion content disentangle subspace. We can generate arbitrary long trajectories which will correspond to arbitrary long videos. We can control content and motion, and so on. Now, let's try to come up with an architecture that can implement these ideas. We can condition the image generator with two latents, content and motion. We can then keep the content fixed while sampling new motion codes to generate videos. Image and video discriminators can be used to train the generator. The question is, how to sample from the latent? We can just sample two Gaussians for content and motion. This doesn't work, however, since the model can completely discard one of the latents. There is no inductive bias in the framework. What if we can cheat a little? We sample content from a normal distribution while we use a step function to sample from motion. For kth frame, the motion code will look like k times 0.1. In this case, it actually works since the motion can be completely described by, the, by such model. So the generator needs to know how to count. Let's use a slightly more complicated data. Shapes are now moving along Bezier curves. The trick no longer works since the direction is random, the acceleration is non-zero, and shapes have state. The initial location is also random. So let's just learn this using a recurrent neural network. I now present the Mokogam framework. We sample content from a normal distribution, we sample the first motion code, and generate an image. We do this multiple times and generate a video. Each frame of this video should be a realistic one, so we sample one frame and discriminate it. A consecutive subsequence of frames should be a good video, so we sample t consecutive frames and use a video discriminator to tell whether they look good. We do the same for real videos to train discriminators. Motion codes are learned using a recurrent neural network with the initial state H0. In this framework, a video is a content code and a motion trajectory. Well, these videos were better than the state of the art in 2018, but they don't look very good today, especially if you compare it to how images look in 2021. This is the quality of images we can get in 2021, and maybe even better than that. The question is, can we generate videos with such quality? Well, in fact, these are videos generated by the Mokogan HD approach. Let's get back to our exploration of the GAN latent space. Here is an image morphine. It's not temporal. It doesn't have any temporal dynamics. But can we find such trajectories that will correspond to meaningful temporal events? In our recent work, we do exactly this. The idea is that if there exists a generator that can generate any image, then it can generate any video, because a video is just a set of static pictures. All you need then is a good image generator and a framework to find such trajectories. How to do this? We sample the first frame. Then this latent code becomes our content from now. We encode it with an LSTM encoder and generate a new H2. The problem with H2 is that it doesn't necessarily lie in the subspace used by the generator. We therefore project it into this subspace by using the PCA basis computed on multiple latent codes of style gun after processed through the MLP. We then add this projection to the content code and to generate the next image. We can do this arbitrarily long to generate a long video. The latent trajectory is built using motion residuals. We condition it by using a random motion code passed to the generator to the recurrent neural network. We however noted that it can get discarded. To avoid this, we add mutual information constraint here. Now we can generate a video. We can train the framework using a video discriminator and an image discriminator, similarly to Mokogam framework. The latter, in addition to the randomly sampled frames, takes the first frame as the input. We noticed 
that in such framework it's very hard to preserve identity of the object. Two discriminators are not sufficient for this and we need more explicit regularization. Contrastive learning comes at rescue here with perturb images. If the images correspond to the same identity, it gives us a positive pair. We compute the cosine similarity requiring images of the same identity to be close. We can run standard benchmarks at 256 and show results significantly better than the state of the art. But let's see if we can do something more interesting. We can do content and motion control generation, similarly to Mokogan. In the left, each row, in each row the content is the same, in the right, in each row the motion is the same. That's interesting. Let's further examine how image and video data look. Here images are high resolution and very high fidelity. Videos are much lower resolution and also they're blurrier. Another point to note is that for some objects, video data is not available at all. How hard is it to find a dataset of speaking dogs? Our method uses a fixed generator. The generator is trained once and is trained on images and then fixed. Can it be trained on disjoint datasets of videos and images? It can be. We train the generator on high resolution and high quality images and keep it fixed. We then train the video part with the available video data. In this case, the images contain docs. The videos contain people, faces, talking. Here is the result. Dogs are talking. The same works for anime images. We retrain the generator to produce diverse anime images. Video part is again trained on people faces. We get talking anime characters. I'd like to note here that the framework has not seen any talking dog or an anime face during training. We then can do a similar thing for time-lapse videos. We use images from the Elsan Church dataset and videos from a time-lapse dataset. We can then generate time-lapse churches, which again have not been observed during training. I usually don't show any tables in my slides, but this one I'd like to show. Remember that the generator is fixed here, so it's trained once. Such an approach gives substantial improvement in the inception score. But that's secondary. Have a look at single model training cost. For the DVD GAN, the second best model, which is based on Big GAN, it is more than $30,000 for a single training run. For our model, it is an order of magnitude less, and our model produces higher resolution videos. Clearly, our model doesn't solve the problem yet and more research is needed, but at least it's scalable. I think it's our job as researchers not only to show promising results, but also to minimize their economic and ecological costs. All right, we've seen two works that generate videos from noise. Both of them use a disentangle representation. This allows the user to have some form of control over the result. They can switch content, sample different motion. There is no, however, any semantics behind what is being generated. Two different motion trajectories will generate two different videos. What will be different, we don't know. We therefore call such methods do something approaches as they will generate something and we don't know what. In many cases, however, it is desirable to generate semantically meaningful actions. Such as in tennis, for example, we'd want the player to go left, right, or hit the ball. In breakout, we'd like to move the platform left, right, and similarly for the robot arm movements. In the do something approach, this is not available. A different do as I say approach is necessary, and such approach allows the user to play the game. For example, by moving the tennis player, we can play tennis. By moving the platform, we can play breakout. We therefore call our approach playable video generation. In it, we use unlabeled video dataset to train the model. 
unlabeled since we don't know the actions that happen in the video. The model during training can figure them out automatically. At test time, these actions can be executed and the player can be moved as the user wants. How to train such a model without any labels? Given two consecutive frames, we first embed them using an encoder network to obtain image features. Some action happened between these two frames and the action network seeks to identify which action exactly. After the action is identified, the future frame is fully defined by the feature embedding of the previous frame plus the identified action. Hence, an updated feature embedding can be generated by the Dynamics model implemented as a recurrent neural network with a previous state. We then can generate the next frame using the new state of the Dynamics network. Here we see the first opportunity for self-supervision. We found that pure image space supervision is insufficient here. We move on by unrolling the network in time, generating several frames. We then embed the generated frames again using the encoder and use self-supervision for actions, features, and finally images. The main caveat is in the action representation. For example, here we see three instances of the same action, move right. Different agents can perform the action differently, hence a single action class label is not sufficient. Actions consists of the deterministic part, AT, describing which action should be used. Discrete action label does not account for how much action is performed, action speed, and other factors. To address this, we add action variability. Recall that our model is unsupervised. We don't supervise any of these action parts. So how to learn them? We embed image features again to get action embeddings. We then subtract the embeddings to obtain the difference vector dt. A fully connected network then uses dt to predict one hot action label. If we visualize the space of dt and use different colors to represent each action as recognized by the fully connected network, we will see that the same actions are located close to each other in the space. We compute action centroid as CK and use the spread from the centroid as an action variability measure computed as shown here. The intuition is that the further the action is from its center, the more differently is its execution from the average action. For tennis, the model has learned seven distinct actions which correspond to move right, advance to the net, move back, move left and stay. Some actions repeat. We can see that actions are consistent in each column. Each row represents a different way of executing the action, including varying speed, direction, and the way the action is performed. Similarly, for robot arm movement, we observe clear actions such as move left, move right, move top, as well as diagonal actions such as action 4. To further visualize actions, and it's in their space, we perform action variability interpolation. For these five actions, we set action variability to zero. Then we move from one action's android to another and render the videos. We clearly see a diagonal action as a result of interpolating variability between move left and advance to the net. We observe similar behavior as we interpolate between action pairs. For example, action six is stay in the same place. We then move the centroid towards the action, we observe that the action speed reduces. At inference time, only the encoder, the decoder and the dynamic networks are used. We connect the dynamics networks to a game controller of the user and the user can play a video. We implemented a demo that runs in a browser purely in JavaScript. We perform a user study to assign the actions to their one-hot encodings. So let's play now. First, we play breakout. There are three actions, move left, right and stay. As the user presses the button, the platform moves accordingly. We can pick a different starting frame by clicking new. The model learned to generate plausible trajectories for the ball. 
The model learned that the trajectory of the ball is fully determined by the platform, hence is not affected by actions. The ball can hit bricks, reflect from the wall, from the walls. One hint to identify that the video is generated is that the score is fixed. The model didn't learn to update it. We can similarly play tennis and the robot arm. We can clearly see that when the user presses the button, the agent performs the corresponding action. Alright, in this talk we've seen video generation models that allow us to generate motion content control videos. Then we saw the newly proposed playable video generation work which offered more control. And now Alexander will present several works that allow us to animate static images offering even more control over the generative process. We call this as do-as-I-do do generation and I am happy to pass the floor to Alex.